So this is the operations dashboard. So when you, log, you go to app.nyansa.com and you log in and you see all your data. I'm showing you live data from uh, an environment. And basically what, you know, what we're looking at on the screen is first off there's the current incident status, which is just you know, what's the highest priority incident uh, that's going on right now related to these topics, whether it's related to the internet, radius, Wi-Fi, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if it's P3 or below, this is going to be green. If it's P2 or P1, it's going to be yellow or, or red. Um, down here on the bottom left is something we call global advisory notifications. So what this is, uh, just I'll give it to you by example, this client Mac OS X radius performance over here is basically Apple put out an advisory saying that Mac OS X devices have a problem with certain radius certificates where they keep getting prompted over and over again for their username and password, even though they've passed radius. And so what we do is we look on the wire uh, to see, OK, are there Mac OS X devices in your environment having this problem where they pass radius, but it takes them like 40 seconds to do so every single time? And if it's relevant for you, we're going to show you here. Uh, any, any questions, by the way, so far? Just shoot questions if, if you guys have. OK, so you know, as another example, if Cisco put out an advisory saying that this controller software version has a security flaw, if this was a Cisco environment, this tend, uh, happens to be an Aruba environment, then that would be shown here if they have a software version that's less than that, that version, as an example. La uh, second last on, on this page is just our notion of peak congestion. So again, by example, I'll just show you guys. So, Congestion or, or capacity, if you're trying to evaluate that, you know, you, you evaluate at a peak usage and you want to determine, do you have enough capacity in your system to handle your peak load? So as an example, the last peak for DHCP happened basically right now. Uh, 7,800 clients tried to use, get an IP address from DHCP. 77 of them faced high latency or high average transaction times. From a Wi-Fi perspective, the last peak, again, is happening right now. 8,600 clients tried to use Wi-Fi. 44 of them connected to an access point radio with channel utilization greater than 40%. So it's kind of a notion of radio congestion in the case of Wi-Fi. So each of these different services has a different notion of congestion. And we only evaluate this at peak <coughs> load so that it gives you an idea of, of you know, do you have enough capacity in, in your system? Can I change those parameters so that I can you know, you might say 40% yeah. is yeah. bad, where I might not care until I hit 60%. <laughs> Got it. So in general, we don't change parameters because we make the same measurements everywhere, sure. both in your environment as well as other environments. Uh, and I'm, again, as I'll show you, sort of the, the comparison I requires guess, that. So that's a, yeah. But that does bring up a question, yeah. though, is again, is so how, how, does your, how does Voyance decide what a good baseline is if yeah. we can't adjust those parameters? Right, so, so we decide, you know, so, so the idea as an example with channel, channel utilization, let's say we pick 40%, which, which we do as, as our threshold. Um, if you have an environment which has 60%, let's say it's a stadium or something like that, um, then we expect more clients to actually see channel utilizations greater than 40% than say an enterprise or something like that. So you'll still see the effect if your environment is worse or better. But the key is we want to keep comparisons apples to apples. So both within your environment, we always want to be making the same measurement, as well as in other environments, we always want to be making the same, same measurement. So that's, that's why we do that. But how do you deal with different vendors measuring the same thing in different ways? If you're trying to, if you just got done saying, but we're yeah. kind of measuring apples to apples, but yeah. look at CU or duty cycle, yeah. right? Every vendor measures it differently. And so today we're a... careful about that in that we don't compare across vendors, those kind of metrics because of that very point. Um, stuff that we see off the wire, like for instance, things like uh, roaming issues that we see on the wire where a client roams, but we see on the wire their TCP sessions all drop. Something like that we could probably compare across vendors, um, you know, but typically we're, we're pretty careful about that because of that, that, that exact thing. Any other questions? That would be really useful to know though from a <laughs> anti-Gartner kind of <laughs> fair, fair, fair. So certain things where we're sure and you know are non-controversial, let's say, we can we can definitely share that. Yeah. There's one question off Twitter that um, sure. seems to be there's a lot of companies doing span tap to get analytic data, and that they're seeing not you don't catch all the data with a span or yep. a, a tap port. 
uh, one other way, like you have hooks into controllers. And yeah. Are you getting additional data out of the controllers or the infrastructure to help inform that analytics as well? Or just like what information are you getting out of the infrastructure directly? Yeah, so, so it depends on the vendor. And that's where you know, the support for different vendors and the metrics that different de vendors provide are, are all different. And so as much as we can, we use those metrics that we pull out of the controllers. Um, but typically, they're not sort of comprehensive. And that's why we need the span port to do sort of extra DPI, as well as extra iteration on metrics. So all of a sudden, some new protocol comes out or some new type of device comes out. We don't want to wait for, let's say, the vendors to implement those metrics in their controllers before we can start reporting on it. And so that's, that's kind of the way we look at it, as having that secondary source that we can manage and we can control to get that kind of data. Are you using um, like built-in like application visibility control where I'm, where I'm already doing deep packet inspection at the controller level? Mm -hmm. Are you then taking that same data that we already know what it is and then sending it across the span and then re-deep packet inspecting it? So, or, or yeah, so, so the thing is we try and do things that other, you know, it, if all we're doing is let's say app ID, that would kind of be pointless because that's probably already being done in the controller or by your Palo Alto firewall. Right. and so on. But for us, applications are more for performance. So what we want to do is, OK, we identify an application, let's say Skype. I'll show you an example. Um, but we want to identify that for what are the performance issues going on for that application. So are there TCP retransmits, latency, what's going on in the Wi-Fi, and stuff like that. So we tr you know, for the most part, we're doing orthogonal things to what other products are doing. In the limit of all this, if the controller vendors or if there's already existing network infrastructure that's getting all the metrics that we need, then the crawler off the span port is not necessary. So that's kind of in the limit, but sort of for now, um, that's where we get a lot of the data. So okay, let me keep it moving for, for time purposes. So um, lastly on the operations dashboard, this is just a quick view of location by location analysis, where things may look green overall, but there's certain locations within your environment. You know, for Wi-Fi, for example, this particular AP group, Slosberg, is much worse than, you know, uh, than other areas. From an internet congestion perspective, this area is much worse than other areas and so on. And I'll show you, I'll show you more of that now. So this is kind of just a real-time snapshot. This is the operations dashboard, as I said. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is um, trending and reporting information and the comparisons and all, and baselining and all that kind of stuff. So this applies to any metric that we, that we measure. So from DNS, you know, clients not being able to connect you to DNS, to Wi-Fi performance, to Wi-Fi congestion, all of these things, we, we trend baseline and report on all of this stuff. So this example, we're looking at Wi-Fi congestion over the last month in this particular uh, environment across all locations within that environment. And what you'll see here is that there's a baseline that, that we evaluate. Um, so we use real data, I and mean, we'll show you the data points. So in this case, on March 21st, they had 8,100 clients connect, um, and 55 of them faced that channel utilization issue that I alluded to earlier. Um, and so you'll see data points. These are all evaluated at peak. So whenever you see gaps in the data, it's because we just didn't see a peak. So typically, people will ask us, hey, what if I have a holiday or something like that? You know, is, does your baseline get affected? For us, it's all statistical. We do it based on the amount of usage. And so gaps will kind of appear automatically based on holidays or anything like that that happen. Um, and s any questions uh, there? OK. So you know, in this particular case, the baseline is around 0.4, 0.5% on average over the last month. Um, the first question we, try, we answer is, OK, to, to GT, the point GT alluded to earlier, I made a change. What difference does it make? So this is an example of a, of a fake manual annotation that I just made, which is I updated AP power levels on this day. And the, the question is, did it make a difference? And what difference does it, did it make? And so in this case, you know, not much of a difference. It actually made things worse, right? increasing or decreasing this, these power levels. And, but the idea is that we give you the ability to quantify the effect the change had and the ability to share that. And just really quickly, Keith had asked a question earlier about automatically detecting changes. So this is a screenshot from another company. I've hidden the company's identity. That's, that's why it's a screenshot. 
But these are automatically detected annotations. So we automatically detected that they upgraded their controllers here. We automatically detected that they enabled band steering here and here. And you can see from a Wi-Fi performance perspective, upgrading the controllers made a big positive impact in terms of lowering the percentage of clients that faced poor Wi-Fi performance. Cool. That's an example, for instance, of automatically annotating, uh, annotating these changes. And where are you getting that from? <laughs> traps from the controller or? Traps from the controller, yeah, yep. yep. okay. exactly, exactly. So with that, let me go back. So that's part one. I made a change, quantify the effect that it had. Let me share that information. The next question we answer is, OK, let's say my, you know, I've made these changes and my baseline is something like 0.4% facing Wi-Fi congestion, as this example. Is that good or bad? Right? What's the objective evidence to say, should we keep working on this to try and reduce this to zero? Or should we move on to other kind of issues that, that we should spend our time on? And for that, that's where the benchmarking comes into play. So this is this particular environment. Um, you know, they have around 2,000 access points and around 17,000 unique wireless clients per week. Um, what we do is it's a university environment, this particular environment. And what we compare it to are other universities that are similar to it. So you can see you know, this is completely anonymous. They would never know who Site 22 is, and that can even change uh, who, who that is. They have around 18,000 wireless clients, uh, and 2.3% face wireless congestion in that other environment. There's another university where 8.3% face wireless congestion, and they have around 13,000 wireless clients, and so on. And what we do is we develop a benchmark from these similar environments across every single one of these metrics to try and give direction to say, you know what, this is an area, as an example in this particular environment, that you're actually doing quite well in. So you should actually be focused on other things where you're not doing well compared to the benchmark. Um, and yeah. this is something that, that the end user can select, say, compare me to other people in my similar vertical? So, we auto so in this, we automatically compare you to similar, so we say similar companies. We should really say university because we already know this is a university. Mm -hmm. But enterprises get compared to other enterprises. Stadium or LPVs would get compared to other LPVs gotcha. and that kind of thing. Yeah. Where does that classification get set from? From you guys or from my group? So like if I'm you would tell us. Okay, so you would tell us. Because the one one of the scenarios that I was yeah. mentioning on, on Twitter was that you know large churches yeah. in Drew's state. Yeah. You know, they basically are <laughs> stadiums okay, yeah. right now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and mine too, by the way. Yep. I'm just saying. You know, <laughs> does Tennessee count as a state? So, uh, so for, for me, I, I'm curious as to you know, how would that be tagged? Because I could see them going into a couple different categories yep. possibly. So I guess, could I select and say I'm part of multiple categories if I wanted to to see multiple data points? We like haven't that? run into that yet, but well, it's, a, it's absolutely a fair use case. Like large to, public venue yeah. also, you've yep. got... You know, you've got 5,000 seaters and you've got 50,000 seaters. Which one, can, you know, how does... So amongst the large public venues, we'd look for the number of simultaneous unique clients okay. and try and compare LPVs with the same number, cool. approximately. So that's kind of, and that's kind of what we're doing even here as well. Uh, go ahead. So I, I just have a really hard time getting past this color scheme. Is there some <laughs> templatized, you know... <laughs> Like give me a give me a not you know give me a date friendly online. view or something like that. We need a southern view. There, yeah, it's, southern view. it's got little guns and you know, <laughs> like, just, anything. anything. This is just so hard to see. The non Johnny Cash version. I think this is about this the color looks a lot risk. better when it's not on a washed up. Right when exactly. it's on a screen. If you if you look at it on the screen, it's, it's, okay. it's better. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Sorry. Yeah. Man. <laughs> Pull so, the live stream. The wireless might help yeah. hold you here. All right, so another but, but for you, we can talk about color schemes as well. <laughs> yeah. so another question on the um, seeing each other's sites kind yeah. of thing. Um, have you thought about letting people opt in to not be anonymous? So if, like, if I want to share with other universities and they see me and yeah. they can click on it and know who I am, and then if we have something to talk about, you know, kind of foster... Yeah, so people have asked us that question, you know, as we show, you know, this company 30, can I talk to them or whatever? And can you guys facilitate it? Yeah. It would make us kind of like a Tinder for... 
You weren't supposed to say we, Tinder. We, oh, there you go. Like LinkedIn. I oh, think. LinkedIn. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, we know where we're going. That's good. I'm, I'm texting your wife right now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that, that's better, G2. Let's, let's use that. <laughs> Be so, LinkedIn. Swipe left. Okay, so... so, so <laughs> I'm swiping. <laughs> so, so the last thing here is, okay, in this particular, you know, case... I'm actually really good, but let's say I was really bad or anything like that. The next question that people would ask would be, what are those other environments doing in terms of the various factors that influence Wi-Fi congestion in this particular case? So if I scroll down here, we start to get into things like load balancing being enabled, DFS channels being enabled, you know, the percentage of five gigahertz capable clients, the channel widths being used, and controller models, controller software, all that kind of stuff. And the idea is to look at this stuff from a client perspective. So, you know, AP models as an example, right? In this case, we're not <coughs> saying that 46% of the APs are AP225s. We're saying that 46% of the clients are connecting to AP225s. So just because you, you have, you know, the latest 325s, but they're in a lab and no one's connecting to them, that doesn't influence performance uh, in, ter in terms of this. So the, so the last part of this is really that, which is what are the factors that influence this? And let me just see statistics about what the top companies are doing, what the bottom companies are doing in, in my vertical to sort of make that happen. Well, specifically five gigahertz support on clients, which you had up, up top. Yep. I mean, it, sure. how are you telling if a client supports five gigahertz or doesn't if that's just a stupid client that never... So or, or a bad controller configuration, right? You're gonna lump all of those clients into so, it. So that's true. So, so our sort of dumb way of doing it right now is um, if a client ever connects on a five gigahertz radio, it's five gigahertz capable. Otherwise, it's not. <laughs> and so the, but this, I, I think yeah. that leads to the importance of looking yeah. at things beyond just span sure. on ports. Is, of course, yeah. Does it make sense to have a radio tap header capable device to be able to detect on Actually, what where probes are coming from? Yeah, what a client device yeah. element says it can do. And yep. No, no, no. Absolutely. So more data is better for sure. And we, I mean, the the architecture is such that we can incorporate more sources of data. So you know, we can talk about this later. But you know, unified communications like Microsoft Link, for instance, we actually get data from their SDN server right. to sort of correlate it with everything that we do. And so we're we're absolutely not opposed to getting more data and and incorporating it. The thought process for us was how to make this as friction-free as possible in terms of an initial deployment and value. So today, it's, there's two touch points. It's the span port and the pointing metrics from your wireless controller. But absolutely, the more data that we can get from other systems, we'd love to incorporate that as well. So, OK, so the last thing, or the, the next thing over here, just really quickly I wanted to show you guys, is also by location. You know, so as an example here, if I switch over, sorry, not to DNS connectivity, but these are the percentage of clients that can't connect to the network because they fail at ARP. So they ask for, you know, ARP for their default gateway and then get no response. Now, you can actually compare this across different locations within your environment. So there's a particular AP group in, in, in this environment. I can look at that over the last month. And what we do is the same kind of baseline comparison between your different locations in your environment. So this is an area where the, the number of wireless clients in two weeks is around 289. You know, we're looking at other environments that have around 289 clients and comparing it to that. And you can see a huge deviation where 10% of the clients here fail on ARP uh, compared to the rest. And actually, the, there's, there's a reason for this, which is that this is where their lab controller is located. And it has a completely different setting from a VLAN pooling and so on uh, standpoint. And that's why whenever people come into this VLAN, they ARP for their old gateway and then they fail. But, so, so there's a reason to this. But the idea is to give people indications of not only is a problem happening overall, but where those problems are localized. Because as we all know, I mean, most of these problems tend to be localized in, in ways like this. So any, any questions, comments so far? OK. So the last page I wanted to show you guys, um, or the second last, I guess, is what we call the incidents page. So this is basically where we show all of the incidents that we detect in your environment, and more importantly, their priority. So an incident to us is something you can describe in plain English. 
you know, clients could not connect because of radius. Clients could not connect due to ARP. Clients had poor Wi-Fi performance, and so on. That's, that's what we call an incident. Um, the part about priority, so let me click in on this. What it's saying is that over the last week, clients having poor Wi-Fi performance reached the highest priority level it reached was a P2. And the summary was 508 out of 4,000 clients were affected, which is around 12%. It's a breakdown of the kind of devices and the bands and so on. But the reason this got elevated to being a P2 was because of this baseline comparison. So this is the incident that we're looking at in question, where 12% when 4,000 were using. And what we do is we compare that to data points in the past where around 4,000 clients were using the network, because that's the way we get an apples to apples comparison here. And so by looking at those data points, you know, you can see here close to 4,000, we develop a baseline. Oops. And we say, OK, 6.8%. When 4,000 clients use Wi-Fi, typically 6.8% of them should have bad Wi-Fi. Now all of a sudden, close to 12% have bad Wi-Fi. And this is configura uh, configurable in terms of what priority level this should manifest at. In this case, it manifested as a P2. And they would have actually gotten an alert for this. So that's, I have a question oh, go ahead. Right Keith, yep. How are you judging if something, if you have a poor Wi-Fi performance when you're only capturing data on the other side when it becomes an Ethernet frame? No, no, no. So from the Wi-Fi controller, so, so what we do so for... If, 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 you, yeah. if you're talking to a controller you don't have traps to, you don't get that information. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so what we get, like let's take you know, Cisco or Aruba, any, any, any of the vendors, we get things like client signal to noise ratio, client uh, layer two retransmits from the access point perspective, the amount of data transmitted and so on. And so our judgment of poor Wi-Fi performance is actually a relatively simple measure. We make sure a client is trying to transmit some data so he's just not associated. Um, so he has to be transmitting a minimum amount of data and he has to have really bad signal to noise ratio or, and or really bad layer two retransmits. Then we deem him as having bad Wi-Fi. But that's still from the perspective of the AP, not yep. from the client's own perspective. Absolutely, yeah. So I, 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 but, think, I think the idea is how are you guys getting that data? It's not from the wire, so you guys are doing like SNMP? Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly, with, exactly. From yep. that, okay. Yep, yep, yep. And so other API or just SNMP? Right uh, SNMP, okay. SNMP, yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. But just a point, Keith, uh, we all know, I think, is that there's nothing that can really give us the perspective of the client device. An agent. Right. Yeah. Yep. So realistically give us a perspective on the client device. <laughs> <laughs> nice GT. So so these well, yeah. these deviations that you're seeing, these yep. will these can then hook into my help desk system and automatically create a ticket? Yeah, so like that. so that's what we're in the process of talking to customers about, about what kind of systems we should integrate with to get the maximum uh, you know effect there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so the next part of this is just, you know, okay, this is 12% overall, but again, localized problems. Tell me about areas where it's really, really bad. And that's where sort of this comes in, where this AP group has really bad, um, you know, much worse Wi-Fi performance than other AP groups in, in, in the environment. Um, and by the way, in terms of location, you know, AP group is one way to specify it in that we get that automatically. But the other way is to automatically define locations, you know, based on access points or regular expressions based on names and things like that. And that'll all get baselined and go through the system as well. Um, and then finally, just scrolling down further, you know, 508 clients total affected, 129 of them, these were the symptoms that manifested. So we're checking things like, hey, was there interference from uh, like nearby neighbors, layer two retransmits, was the client moving and so on. And we're checking all that stuff, and we're sort of grouping different client sets by the different symptoms that we see. And that's kind of what this is. You have all the clients that you can access at your fingertips here, and you can sort of click on them, get more details about it, and sort of dive down as deep as you want to go in terms of uh, root cause and getting to final root cause. So for those deployments that have um centralized controllers up at a head end that are highly distributed, I'm yep. thinking uh, large distributed retail. Right. Are, are you going to have a collection point at each individual store, for example? Um, or what, I guess what I'm asking is what sort of fidelity do you get out of just pulling a controller versus doing a span port? Because many yep. times that's simply not available. Right. I mean, this goes to Andrew's question as yeah. well. So it depends on what the vendor gives us. And the different vendors are different. 
in terms of what fidelity. I mean, at a minimum, we get the, what's that? Do you have a preferred vendor? <laughs> oh, don't, don't, don't get me in trouble. Without, without, without you know, <laughs> offline, we may. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you grab a beer afterwards and uh, <laughs> talk about that. That happens tonight. <laughs> exactly. So a quick question on that then. Yep. So for, let's say, some of those distributed environments, if yep. the vendor's network management system has an API access to get that out from a central point rather than a distributed yep. point, yeah. do you hook into any NMS systems via APIs or anything like that? Rather than getting the actual infrastructure, getting their management system. They could tighten the today we do it from the controller. Okay. That's, that's how we do it today. I mean, we haven't explored that. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of power in pulling information off the wire. I mean, that's... That's huge. So we really, it's preferable to do that, that we go into installations that where we can tap off the wire. So what, what about, uh, you know, we talked about a little about distributed environments. Yep. Um, we're seeing more move towards virtualized both control plane and data plane. Mm -hmm. um, when you start talking about that inside of a, a virtualized environment, yep. taps become really challenging to yep. get uh, because all east-west traffic may not necessarily right. leave the, the hypervisor. Right. How do you guys plan to address that? Is this a, I have to tap each host? In order, and then aggregate those in order to feed data in? So it depends on what you want us to an analyze, really. So, so our, our take, take on it is if we can see it, we can analyze it. So you know, for instance, if you had sort of a use case of, I only want to analyze SaaS applications, how my clients perform on SaaS applications, then we just need to tap off the WAN, and then we're good. But on the other hand, if it's like, OK, I want to analyze my DHCP radius, DNS, all that kind of stuff, then you know, we might need a different kind of choke point. If you want to analyze an east-west application, then it's, it's different as do, well. Do you guys do any like, I, like, you know, just tap infrastructure where they're, you're physically tapping multiple ingress points, at putting them into an aggregator, and then taking a? Yeah, so, so the architecture is such that you can put as many crawlers as you want in your environment. All the aggregation and deduplication and stuff like that happens in the cloud. So that's kind of how, how we would do it, um, yeah. Any plans, and, and uh, this is totally speculative sure. on your part, but any yep. plans to work with someone like Fortinet or work with directly with Cisco or someone to integrate the ability to use an existing device as a tap to get away from something that you guys have to do? Right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, in the limit, that's our ideal scenario, to be honest. I, as I was saying before, if these metrics and things like that could be collected by existing infrastructure, and it was all the metrics that, are, that would be needed to do this analysis, our value add is really in the analysis, the baselining, the cloud an analytics, and all that kind of stuff. So we would love that, but yeah, as of right now, just and that's I think that that's a really yeah. cool model. Uh, there's there's other companies um, that have done that. They've formed those partnerships. Yeah. And they, you know, they focus on what they're really good at. Yeah. And I, I love that model personally. Yeah. It makes life way easier for me. Yeah. Definitely, definitely, definitely. So cool. Um, just one last thing I wanted to show you guys in terms of just raw data, where this all comes from, and what, what we're you know, um, looking off of. Um, you know, just a couple of clients that I know just have issues. Um, HP printers in this particular environment. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, in this case, I, everything is searchable within the product, so I just search for this client. This is kind of the root cause remediation, a little bit of the help desk use case in some sense. You know, we already detected this. The client could not connect you to DNS, but the root cause is a, a client misconfiguration. Nothing to do with the DNS infrastructure. Where that data came from is if I click over here, it's something we call the event timeline. So if I expand that, this is raw data to us. Like, you know, so we don't hide any data. Everyone can look at like metrics as well as this data. But you know, from, from a raw data perspective, we saw this guy go through DHCP successfully, ARP for his gateway successfully, but he failed at DNS because he was trying to talk to 192.168.0.1, which didn't match the DNS servers given by the DHCP server. So that's kind of one example of, of raw data. Um, just you know, another really quick example um, is, um, let's see if I can find this guy. Another user sort of having Skype issues, um, and you know, I looked this up before, it's 4.13, you know, 10 to 11 a.m. So let me just look at that. Well, real quick while you're yep. doing this, is sure. there, so I mean, this is all obviously from the system admin perspective, yep. all of us managing networks yep. looking at this. Is there any opportunity to, just for what it's worth, to provide sure. this as a client 
is, is a piece of software that runs on a client device, that runs on a tablet, something where, yeah. where as a diagnosis tool for an, for an end user, right. an agent who can an say, agent, yeah. why is it my Wi-Fi working? Yeah. And it pops up and says, well, yeah. it's not your Wi-Fi, it's your, right. you know, AIM isn't connecting. We've definitely thought about it. As of, I mean, it goes back to the friction point about sort of asking a customer to put agents on people's devices, especially with BYOD and stuff like that. Our thought is that, you know, well, it's most, a troubleshooting tool. Yeah. I mean, it, it could be one of those things where someone calls true. in and you're troubleshooting, hey, download our, our quick deal and we'll diagnose it. Tell me what the error message is. True, yeah. true, 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 true. So. Or, or what about self-diagnosis, right? Yeah. I, I'm having a problem. <laughs> I hit the, the cloud um, and it's like, hey, this is your MAC address. Yeah. Hey, these are the things I see that you're having problems with. Right. Having a right. problem, you're going to hit the cloud. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you have a flag an automated yeah. message that yeah, says, hey, you're hey, experiencing my, my issues. My Skype's having a problem. You know, it's yeah. like, hey, I'm just hit, hit the cloud and say, okay, you know, hey, it's a global a Skype issue. Yep. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a global Skype so register issue. Register your device and get notifications. Yeah. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. true, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so just really quickly here, you know, the guy was using Skype. But the root cause of it was Wi-Fi. You know, he was having issues of coverage as well as interference. The way we figured this out, again, just from a raw data, just to show you guys everything, you know, all the data is here, all the graphs are here across all these different layers. You know, these were the applications that he was using during this time. I can pull up Skype and look at sort of TCP retransmits and TCP latency in terms of deciding whether Skype was good or bad. The latency was somewhat high. Then, you know, we can look at Wi-Fi and see, okay. Signal to noise ratio, pretty decent, it's 33 dB. Layer two retransmit, much higher, you know, 40, 50% thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And basically, if I go back to this screen over here, this is kind of already done in terms of all of the different symptoms that manifested when he had bad Skype. And it's sort of the group of these symptoms that map to a root cause and remediation. And that's kind of how the system works. From sort of a raw single client analysis, and then it's just all built up from that, sort of looking through all the clients in an environment, and then finally across sites, across environments, and doing that. So that's kind of what I had. So. Did we get this information out? Like, do you have an API? Or Thank you for asking. I was going to ask that too because I was wondering <laughs> yeah. about that. Um, yeah. You know, something where I can integrate it into an internal tool. Yeah. Uh, you know, for for tier <laughs> one help us to be able to just look at some yep. simple reports. Oh, so, uh, so it's something we're in discussions again with customers about what the right integrations and what the right APIs that are needed. As of today, we don't have an API to get the information out. But a lot of customers, especially from the reporting standpoint, have asked for API. So that's, that's definitely something. Ryan, in the interim, is it, in, is it reasonable to ask a help desk to be able to log into a help desk view? So where they would just see, you know, they could search for client devices reactively as calls. Came. I think it would need to be customizable because some, you know, not all help, help desks are created <coughs> equal. Okay. Uh, you need to be able to limit what they can and can't see because. No, no, right. That's what we're meaning. Let's yeah. say you have that control of what they can and can't see. Yeah, I think, I think that a help desk view would be nice to have, but then, you know, taking it even further and allowing some of the information to be pulled and put into my own help desk view in the future mm -hmm. would be um, even better. Okay. A, a huge concern with all these things always is getting data locked in somewhere yeah. that I, I can't right. utilize in the ways that I need to. Because your guys' views are always great because you're, you're saying and looking at things, okay, based off of you know, 20 customer conversations, yeah. this is the dashboard right. view that we've come up at. Right. But based off of what my internal person is telling me yeah. is completely different what this is, I'm not going to go to you and say, hey, yeah. write this for me. I'd rather just, can I get that data out that I need to to yeah. quickly put it into a format that I can show my internal team yeah. and just get something you know, reported on simply? Yeah, no, no, that's, that's absolutely true. I mean, that, from, again, from the reporting standpoint, is the most common place we hear that. Like, I know how I want to present this data to my CIO or whatever. Exactly. And so I want to take that and organize it. Well, even, even managed services organizations yep. that, are, that are looking to use this as a tool. Yep. Yeah. It, yep. That's the same question. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, for maintaining performance SLAs, stuff yep. like that. Yep. Definitely. Or Definitely. changing the interface colors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll notice now it's a white background, right? What happened there? <laughs> we had internal discussions about a button that flipped from, from black exactly. to white. Exactly. Because some people want it to knock, so they want a black background. Yeah. And some people, you know, want white background. Want to be able to read it. Things. <laughs> Things. Things. 
question along the managed service provider yeah. kind of topic. Um, so is this public cloud only, or do you offer uh, a private cloud hosting type of solution? We're in, in the process of investigating what it would take to do a private cloud solution where no data leaves the premise, but trends and metrics where you can see the analysis of benchmarks and things like that wow. still comes, yeah. Okay. So we're trying to, we're, we're in the process of exploring that. But as of, again, today, only the public cloud. And, and as well, along that front, I know it looks like, obviously, from the data you're collecting, that you, know, you have multiple customers' worth of data because you're obviously doing the correlation. What about hierarchy of, of access to view different customer levels? And, and Definitely. No. That's the second most, multi That's the second most common <laughs> thing that we get where, you know, I don't want my help desk team being able to look at the trending and the comparison, for instance. So, you know, role-based access, basically. Absolutely. But today it's yeah. already, when you log in as ESA, Android ESA, you will actually see a list of every one of your customers that are running Buoyance and you can choose from there. So that's already done today. Can you run reports across customers? Yeah. Well, well, but I mean, I mean, that's a natural definitely. part of it. Yeah. That's actually a natural part of it. Well, I mean, product, I, yeah. I know that you're doing that on the back end to create the yeah. baselines and yeah. and all of that, but being able to, you know, maybe look at one customer and say, okay, what are these guys doing that their performance? So, is so well, bad? so so one one example of that that we actually, I mean, a real life example is we have a customer with around twenty different sites, you know, Chicago, San Francisco, et cetera, et cetera. And we run reports for them, which is just give me a viewpoint of all my sites. What are the problems I need to focus on within each site? I want to make sure that there's a good user experience at every single site, or at least consistent, <laughs> um, and so on. So that it's kind of like even a customer with many sites lo starts to look like an MSP. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, was, so, I yeah. was wondering more about comparisons between, um, so that you can see general trends yep. from customer to customer and see if maybe one is an outlier and having many more problems. Definitely. It's different type yep. of hardware. Seriously, can you switch from comparing all of the thousands of other organizations that match our vertical as opposed to all of the organizations that are within my... Yeah, yeah. My Ab absolutely. Purview? And not just yep. see you know, yep. all the problems right. that they're all facing, yep. but see, you know... Be able to go in and say, hey, how did one team deploy yep. the site and how well is it doing compared to how a different team yeah. deploy yep. the site. But One of the things, yeah. sorry, go ahead. I was going to say to Andrew's point though, were you talking about, because like for example, you have, you're a company and you provide services to multiple school districts, let's say, are you saying you want to be able to give like an IT department in a specific school access to their information and they can see the anonymized data across your other customers uh, to see how they're performing? But not be able Traditionally, to look. we don't do that as uh, in our practice. I would say well, what we would be looking for would be multi-tenancy within the product itself, which sounds like you have some mm -hmm. degree of already, yeah. but also at multiple levels, so site level, yeah. district level, mm -hmm. potentially roll-ups to other hierarchies yeah. within, so state level. Yeah. You know, you could you could have multiple levels of hierarchy, yeah. and it, we want to be able to roll up data yeah. into different, yeah. into different, uh, in different groupings. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. One yeah. of yeah. the. One and of the then things API that access to get that data out potentially to report to a customer through something. a different dashboard mm -hmm. or something like that. Just saying, yep. can I create my own like folders groups <laughs> so I can specify how I want it? Some, some sort of hierarchy. I don't know about a lot of folders you, and groups. A lot of you introduced <laughs> yourselves. I'm just kidding. <laughs> a lot of you introduced yourselves as being with VARs or MSPs. One of the things we've seen that have a lot of power mm -hmm. is being able to show other sites. We actually see a lot of people we talk to our res resellers. We are looking at want to use it as a they sales tool. Because you go in and you say, hey, look, we actually upgraded this customer with 11AC Wave 2. Look at the difference it made. Yeah. We came in. So again, perspective customer for you. You come in and say, hey, we actually made this difference on someone else's network. This is what we can do for you. So a lot of people are actually using this as just a sales tool to, to show performance. Yeah. Hey, we are actually something you want to do. Let me yeah. so, go ahead and uh, ask, ask, uh, ask a quick, quick one that they're not going to answer anyway. Um, <laughs> who do you see as your major competitor? <laughs> Um, so there's two different kinds of competition. For functionality, we actually don't feel there is much yet because as far as looking at data comparisons like we do know, we do compete for dollars. So when someone has money to spend, that we do tend to have to compete with other people selling some sort of tool to help you do your job. But when it comes to, I'm not gonna sit here and say, oh, we have everything that no one else has. But so far we haven't, when we go into a customer site, the only time we we just very rarely hear anything, someone say competitive. It's do we have the money in our budget to 
to do this. Okay. So to piggyback on exactly what you said, you know, again, as a VAR, I identified myself as a VAR, right? We've got, I have all kinds of different clients. You can imagine from one, from a municipality all the way down to an RV park. We do, we do a handful of RV parks. And I'm cons I love the product. I think it's great. Everything I've seen so far, I think it's phenomenal. I think I can use it in a thousand different applications and use it as an MSP. Is it going to be priced so that someone like me can take advantage of it for my customers? Because I, I love what it does, but I feel like with the functionality that it's going to be so far out of my reach that I'm not going to be able to get this into the markets that I want it to be in. We're How new enough right now to say that my answer to that is let's talk about it. Okay. I mean, we have a pricing structure, but we, we like to have discussions on that because that's something it's, we I want mean, to explore your business model as well. And it, you know, it piggybacks into the question that, that Andrew was asking about how, you know, an RV park, perfect example. I want the park manager, the real world, real world example, the park manager at the park needs to be able to look at the Wi-Fi experience of all the customers in the park or at a property or an MDU and determine if the hotel or the park is supplying a, a decent service to their customers. Then the regional guy has to be able to see how all of his parks are doing. Yep. And then me as an administrator, I have to be able to know the details of how each one of those are performing and what's going wrong in, in, in any of those locations. Now, that's great, except if it's so expensive that I can't do that at each one of those levels, then there's no point in having a product like this for me. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. And that's that's why Abe's yeah. here and yeah. Abe's the guy to talk to about that yeah. if you have time afterwards. Yeah. And we can, yeah. we're like I said, we're, we want I mean, to look at that. Yeah. I'm not trying to take yeah, the yeah, value no, away no, from no, it. No, no, not at all. No, no, I think so. it's worth a lot yeah. of money. But We're going to quote you on everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that sits with my customers. You know what I mean? If it's, that's, and is it is it going to be, from a licensing perspective, I mean, what... And I don't want to talk numbers because you guys are so new that, I mean, yeah. everything yeah. between now and Monday is probably going to change anyway, you know? <laughs> but, but that being said, you know, from a licensing perspective, you know, are we buying the equipment outright? Is that included in a license cost? You know, what type of support? You know, the what simple pricing, I know Stephen's going to, to hook me off the stage here. <laughs> simple pricing model is there's no charge for hardware, especially it's VM. So if you spin up your own VMs, deploy a thousand of them, we don't care. Cool. We charge either based on number of nodes, which is counted as an AP or a switch, or number of users. So in cases of RV parks where it's transient, that's where probably the nodes would make more sense. Yeah. Uh, hotels are the same way. But then whatever is the cheaper of the two puts you in one of four categories. Nodes, small, nodes medium, large. Like, Switches or APs. Okay. Switches and APs. And, oh, okay. <laughs> Big because we're, you know, we're <laughs> wired ports. and wireless play. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that puts us in, you in categories, small, medium, large, extra large, and then it, talk to Abe okay. from there on out. <laughs> um, so so that's, it's very simple, straightforward pricing, annual subscription, one, three, five year. Um, but we have, but again, it's worth having a discussion with us. We're not going to hand you pricing and walk away. Yeah. It's all worth discussions yeah. at this yeah. point. And do you guys, do you guys, have you established a kind of partner program yet or how you're going to work with, with bars who want to resell it? Or MSPs. We are looking, we're looking at both. We are taking applications, if you will. And the best way to do that is just email me. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, just email me. We do, because of the size of our company, we have to be somewhat limited in, in who we accept just because of manpower, not because of what we can do but, um, or what, what we think someone can do. Well, last question. Nyan Nyansa, what does it mean? Where did it come from? Abe? <laughs> uh, he's going to use the mic if he's going to answer that. <laughs> uh, I knew you were going to speak. Because I already oh, tweeted the Nyan Cat, man. Nyan Cat. <laughs> 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 uh, so the name Nyansa means wisdom. It basically means learning from experience. In what it's, language? It's a word from a Khan. It's a Ghanaian word. Okay. So. Interesting. Yeah, there we go. And you can guess where Abe is from. <laughs> <laughs> the Australia. Also right. <laughs> <laughs> the it's the domain being available is that an important is aspect. Plus. <laughs> well, Steve and I appreciate your time. I know we've taken a little bit more than that. Everybody, you've been awesome. We love you as always. Thanks for, uh, I saw a lot of tweets. We appreciate that. And we'll have a website on Monday. So stay tuned. <laughs> Thanks.